right. I think we're ready to kick it off. So uh, welcome all to this session on type safe GraphQL servers with JDTs. My name is Andreas. I'm an uh, engineering manager at uh, Sendesk, where we see GraphQL playing a more and more important role, which is also why I'm really excited to be talking about GraphQL today. Um, and before we begin, I just want to get a bit of a sense of the room. So how many people are familiar with uh, GraphQL already? If you could raise your hand. OK, quite a number of people. That's impressive. Um, and how many are already familiar with a, a statically typed functional language like OCaml, OK, Haskell, Scala, F Sharp? Wow, OK, this is going to be great. Um, so GraphQL is a, a query language that was probably released by Facebook in 2015. And uh, although it's agnostic to the transport layer and the serialization mechanism, uh, it's by far most often used in the context of web APIs, right? So it's uh, HTTP used for the transport layer and JSON for the serialization mechanism. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of in the same space as REST. It's competing uh, with REST and it tries to address some of the issues that people have found with REST uh, over the years. Um, and one of the most uh, kind of the biggest differences in my mind is that types are front and center in GraphQL. You have this schema that defines types for all data uh, going into the API or coming out of the API, uh, which is something that, that you don't see with REST unless you use some kind of one of these bolded on solutions. It's actually integrated and built into GraphQL. Um, and this schema is also introspectable, which means that the API consumer can ask for this schema and get it back in a machine readable format from the API, which is, turns out to be great for tooling. Uh, there's a number of great GraphQL uh, IDEs and other types of, of tools and automation around uh, in the GraphQL ecosystem. So I've worked with GraphQL for, for roughly three years. In the beginning, it was uh, Ruby and Python dynamically typed languages. And what frustrated me was that I would kind of specify all these types, uh, but in the implementation, I didn't really reap the benefits at all. So even though I said, like, this piece of data is a string, Ruby or Python would happily let me return an integer instead, right? Uh, and that, that kind of sucked. So um, I looked at some of the, the other uh, other popular GraphQL server implementations like in Java and in Go. And it turns out they can't really capture this connection between the externally uh, exposed contract that you have with the consumer and the implementation. The type systems are simply not strong enough to capture this. And even if you turn to something like Flow, the, the static type checker for, for JavaScript that uh, it's built by Facebook, right? GraphQL is a, a Facebook project. Uh, uh, Flow is a Facebook project. You would maybe think that there would be some great synergies there. But unfortunately, that can't capture the connection either. So two years ago, I kind of went on this quest to see, can you build a GraphQL server library that guarantees that the externally exposed contract, the schema, actually um, that you're sure that the implementation matches this contract, that your uh, implementation lives up to the, to the contract. Um, and try to reap the benefits of all the types that you're specifying anyway. Try to reap the benefits in your implementation. And as the title alludes to, it turns out that, that you can capture this connection and that generalized algebraic data types turn out to be a, a key piece in doing that. So that's what we're going to be doing today, trying to uh, capture this connection in kind of a, a minimal implementation of a GraphQL server. So. To kind of explain all of this, we're going to, we, we have this problem, this example domain. Uh, let's say that you have some files and folder structures like the one up here to the left, and you want to expose that via a GraphQL API. Um, we can capture these. This is uh, some types in OCaml. Basically, all of the example code is going to be in OCaml today. I'll try to help you along if you're not familiar with OCaml. Um, but none of the techniques I presented today are specific to OCaml if you are using a language that supports GADTs. So we have a file and a folder type. They have a name each, a file, ha a file has a size, and a folder has, uh, contains a, a list of files and has a, a list of uh, folders. So we're going to try to expose this data over a GraphQL API. Finally, we are going to be serializing things to JSON, so we're going to be using this JSON type here, it's uh, an algebraic data type or a variant type. And we see we have all the, the JSON primitives here, null and float string and bool, as well as the composite types. 
array and objects. So an array is like a list of things, and an object is a, a you know, property and, and value, a list of those. And the basic premise of GraphQL is that you model your data as a graph. So given these OCaml types, we might model our domain as this particular graph. So you'll see that there's roughly like a, a node in the graph per uh, type in the domain, and they are connected with edges, and these correspond to like the fields in the record types uh, over on the right. Uh, we also have this, this query uh, node at the top, which is like the entry point of the graph. Um, and uh, let's try to investigate this graph a little bit further and what it means. So first of all, we need to be able to curate this kind of graph structure. And I'm not going to make you experts in the uh, GraphQL spec today. I'm going to appeal to your intuition instead. Uh, but just to show you what it, it looks like somewhat, this is a GraphQL query. It, it's basically like uh, traversing, it's specifying how to traverse the graph. So you see here that uh, the names here, uh, uh, root, name, files, name, they correspond to kind of walking the edges of the graph. And a response to a query uh, like this might look like the thing on the right here, the JSON on the right. And you'll note that kind of the shape of the response matches the shape of the query exactly. So the, the names of the uh, properties in these GraphQL and the, these JSON objects on the right match exactly the names in, in the query. The second operation that we need to be able to, to support over this graph is uh, introspection, as I mentioned previously. So, uh, we need to be able to, given a, a graph like this, to generate a response, something like this, uh, which is again, is like uh, some JSON that describes the shape of the graph. We can see that the entry point is called query, and we'll get a, a list of JSON objects where each JSON object uh, corresponds to one of the nodes in the graph here, and we can see what are the, what, what are the fields in the, in the graph, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So basically, we should be able to generate the, the picture on the left, given the, the uh, JSON on the right. So what are actually the constituent parts of such a graph? Well, we distinguish between the leaf nodes and the internal nodes. And we'll start looking at the leaf nodes. So a leaf node in GraphQL lingo is called a scalar, and it has a name, and it has a, a source type. That's the data flowing into the node. The, the prime A you see up here, and then it has a serialization function which converts this uh, source type the, uh, into JSON. So an example of this is the, the string node, for example. So a string uh, value flows into the node, and the serialization function must be able to convert a string into JSON, which you, know, you can do pretty trivially. So if we now turn to internal nodes, they're called objects in GraphQL lingo. Uh, they similarly have a name, they have a source type, the data that flows into the node, and then they have a uh, list of, of fields. Uh, each field has a name that's represented by an edge here, and uh, each of the edges can convert the input, the source type, into something else. Uh, so an example here is, is the file. So uh, a value of type file that we saw from our problem domain flows into the node, and there are two fields. Uh, one is name that converts the, the source type into a string, and the other is size, which converts uh, the source type into, into an int. This is, uh... Okay. Um, so when we compose these scalars uh, and object types, um, you can imagine data flowing through the graph from top to bottom. So we start with a unit type flowing into, a uh, unit value flowing into the, the query uh, node. It then traverses a number of edges down to a scalar node where it's converted to JSON. So what you see here is essentially that the resolve functions, the kind of the function that's uh, provided for each edge must compose nicely. So 
uh, our edge out of the query node must convert from, from unit to some type A, and then is, uh, at the end here, it must uh, the result function here at the bottom must convert from, from A to B, and then the serialization function must work from B to JSON. And if we can guarantee that our graph is constructed to fulfill this invariant, then it will be a well-formed graph. Essentially, we'll have no, kind of, no runtime exceptions. Um, all right. So this is like a, a very basic introduction to what we would like to see from an implementation of a GraphQL server library. So let's uh, try to turn to, to actually implementing some of this, capturing this in code. And there's going to be three parts. And the first part is kind of implementing from the bottom up the core. Um, and we're going to be looking at implementing first the, the, the scalar nodes here and then implementing a file node. That's going to be like the first uh, stepping stone. So here we're defining a um, variant type called node. It has a type parameter source, which is the type of the data flowing into the node. And a scalar node has a name and it has a serialization function. So this maps very closely to uh, the description we had previously. And two examples of this would be uh, the built-in types int and string. Uh, which basically converts from something of type int into JSON and something of type string into JSON again. So uh, we're going to be using these. These are essentially kind of uh, the two bottom uh, nodes here in our graph. Um, and that's, that's actually all there is to a scalar node. When we turn to defining an, an object node, it's a little bit more tricky. And uh, the key part to defining an object node is actually to define a field that's like an edge in the graph. So this is our first attempt at defining uh, a field. It's a record type with two type parameters, source and out. And you'll see that it has a name. It has a, an out value, which is the, the next node that the edge is pointing to. And then it has a resolve function, which is the thing that converts from the source type to the output type. So with this in hand, we can try to define the two fields on our node, uh, on our file node, uh, the name field and the size field. And uh, you'll see that the resolve functions are essentially just accessing the name and size property of our file type that we defined for the domain. Um, and you should also know that the type that's assigned to the name field and the size field are different, right? So for the name field, the input, the source type is file, the output type is string. And for the size field, it's, it's the input file, the source uh, type is file, and the output type is int. However, they both belong to the same object, uh, namely the, the file node. So we would like to combine these two, but they won't, for example, fit in a list. If we try, try to put these two in a list, it won't, won't work since they have a different type. So this is essentially our first challenge, and this is uh, where we will have to turn to uh, JDTs to solve this issue. So this is uh, the new definition of our type field, and you'll see that it, it's changed slightly, right? So now it's a, a, a JDT type, a, a variant type. Uh, with a single constructor. Uh, and the most essential part to note is that we've now removed one of the type parameters. Previously, out was part of, was one of the type parameters, but now there's only a single type parameter, which is the source type. So essentially, we've kind of discarded one of uh, the type parameters. And this is something that normally every type variable that, they, that appears on the right-hand side of a type definition must also appear on the left-hand side. But JDTs allow us to hide such a type variable, which is also, this is also called uh, an existential type. Um, so while this might seem like uh, minor, it actually it turns out to be super handy. Uh, in particular, if we look at, this is the, the name field and the size field defined again with our, our new type, we'll see that they have the same type, right? They both get assigned the type file GraphQL field. So this also means they can go in a list together now. They fit in a list. Uh, so with this in hand, defining an, an object type is actually uh, almost trivial. So here I've added a new constructor to our uh, node type. Uh, and it's essentially just like a name 
and a list of fields that share the same source type. And this also means that we can define our uh, file GraphQL node, just giving it a name, file, and the fields will be the name field and the size field, uh, all the types add up. And the, the type for a file node is file GraphQL node. So file here, here signifies the source type flowing into this. So now we have kind of the, the, the basis of our representation of a GraphQL graph. And as mentioned previously, there are two crucial operations we need to be able to perform on such a structure. One is uh, serializing it to, to JSON, and the second is introspection. So uh, let's try and look at briefly how, how this structure would support serializing to JSON. Um, so normally OCaml has uh, amazing type inference and we don't have to specify types anywhere. However, in the face of GDTs, you have to help the type check a little bit. And so the type that, that's manually uh, ascribed here, uh, you can read this as for all source types, uh, given some, some value of type SRC and a uh, GraphQL node that accepts this as input, we can convert it to JSON. And essentially, we, just, we look at the type of the node. If it's a scalar node, we call the serialize function on the source value. If it's a, an object node, then we map over the fields of the object. We call the resolve function on the source value. We get something new back. And we know that this, whatever we get back from the resolve function will match the output type of that field. So we can recurse with those two values. So um, in essence, this means that if we define, let's say here, the readme file, and now we can apply the to JSON function on the readme file and the file node, and we'll get JSON back. So it shows that our representation is amenable to serialization. Um, we can definitely also introspect this, this uh, type, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to omit that for brevity here. So at this point, we have a uh, composable, extensible representation that captures the GraphQL invariants in the type system. So if we construct a graph with these types and it type checks, then we know that the graph is well formed. Essentially, we know that all the resolve functions will add up. Uh, there will be no runtime exceptions or things that, that don't match type-wise. And uh, it can be both serialized to JSON and introspected. So that's kind of our, our first key result. And we're, now we're going to try to, to build on this uh, with, a, with a few more features. So the first feature we're going to try to add on top of this is a, a feature in, in GraphQL called type modifiers. And um, by looking at kind of the next type that we're missing in our graph, we'll see why that's useful. So, we have our string node and we have our file node, but there is also a folder node in our graph, right? And if we look at the fields of the folder node, we have the, the name field, which is by now trivial to implement. We can use, we can already represent that. But if we look at the files field and the folders field, we'll see that they have these list types in, uh, in the, as the output. So uh, we can really represent lists at this point. So how do we do that? So here we have our uh, good old node type again, and uh, you'll notice that I've added a uh, constructor now called list that accepts a uh, node and returns a new node. However, the source type parameter has been extended by with this list here. Uh, so let's say you have, if you remember our GraphQL string from previously, now we can apply the list constructor to our GraphQL string, and we'll get back a new GraphQL node uh, with a source type of string list. So this is how we can introduce and handle lists uh, in, in our representation. So in particular, if we look at the files field that we need for our folder node, uh, the output value here of the field is GraphQL list file node. And this will have type file list GraphQL node. And since the source type, our file list is folder, you'll see that the type of the resolve function is folder arrow file list. So 
kind of all the types match up, the source type, the out type, and the type of the resolve function. So just for completeness, uh, this would be the complete specification definition of our folder node. Uh, there's the name field and the files field. Those shouldn't be uh, super interesting by now. We've, we've looked at those. Uh, but the folders field is, is uh, noteworthy a little bit at least uh, since we have this recursive structure here. Uh, so we can see there's a let rec folder node here at the top. And then we can apply a folder uh, use folder as part of the definition of folder, which is uh, quite handy that we can represent this uh, recursive structure. The final missing piece to uh, introducing the type modifier list into a system is how it affects serialization. And it turns out to be uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we simply ha need to uh, have additional uh, case here in our match statement. So we're matching something of type list here. And uh, at this point, we know that this, the, the source, uh, source value here must be a list of something. And the elements in that list much, must match the type of this node prime. So we can map over the elements in the list and recursively call to JSON. Uh, and we'll end up with a list of JSON elements. And we can convert that then in the end into a JSON list. And to show this kind of all works out, we can define our root folder value. Uh, that was kind of, it captures the, the files and folders in, uh, in, in the example I showed initially, where we have like the readme file, a subfolder with a main ML and a, a library ML file. And we can now call to JSON on this uh, root folder value with the folder type, uh, with a folder node, and then we get back this blob of JSON, right? So uh, we've successfully extended our kind of core type representation to handle lists while maintaining all our type guarantees. Um, there are other GraphQL type modifiers uh, that we're going to, to skip today. Uh, in particular, is one for handling optional values. And it turns out it fits very nicely into this representation as well. Uh, and type modifiers are like, a, and then a concept that in other libraries are typically imp implemented using reflection and, and typecasting. But in this case, we're able to uh, capture everything in the type system. We don't have to resort to, to any of those tricks. So the final part, part three, is uh, about arguments. So at this point, we've only really been concerned with the data going out of the graph. So, uh, we have nice types for, for uh, all of that, and it's very type safe, but the data coming into the graph, we haven't really dealt with at all. Uh, the final uh, type or the final node that we haven't um, defined yet is the, is the query node, uh, which only had like a, a single field root, the root folder um, in our graph. But this doesn't accept any input, so it's actually trivial to implement at this point, we, we, we could do that without extending our system. So uh, for the challenge, I've introduced uh, a, a, another field here called search files, uh, which is a field that accepts two arguments, a, a query string and a page with the, which is uh, of type int. So you can imagine this would be uh, searching our folder structure with a given uh, query string and you can paginate over the results. And previously, our uh, the types of our resolve functions were quite similar, right? They mapped from the source type to the output type. And that was, you know, pretty straightforward. But now we have some arguments that we want to pass along to the resolve function. Uh, and the question is like, how, how do you do that in, in a, in a well-typed manner? Um, this is some, something that's typically handled in, in, in other implementations by simply giving you a map from argument names to a JSON value or a argument name to a, a, a object type or any type essentially like interface in Go or object in Java. Um, and the question is, can we do better than that? Can we somehow kind of give the resolve function something that's more strongly typed than just a map from argument name to any. Um, right. Uh, 
So the first thing we're going to do, to do is to define uh, an input type. So that's capturing, we get an argument of type string. This is what we're trying to represent. So an input type has a name like string or int, and uh, it has a coerce function which takes some uh, JSON value and tries to convert it to the, the more uh, accurately typed thing. So for example, here we have a string input type uh, which takes a uh, JSON value and says, it's only if it's actually a string, I'm going to give you back some S, and otherwise I'm, I'm going to give you back none. And the GraphQL server would then reject the query saying, hey, uh, you requested, you made a GraphQL request providing a uh, argument of the wrong type. And similarly, we can define an, an int input type here, which converts a JSON value from int to, to an actual simple uh, int in uh, OCaml. An argument then is a string, which is the name of the argument, like a page. We had the page argument before, and we had the query argument before, and an input type. So uh, we can define these as here's the, the query arc. It has the name query, and it's of type arc string. And we have the page arc, uh, which uh, is of type arc int. So both of these. Uh, relate to the same field, right? The search files field. And now we find ourselves again in the position where we want to uh, kind of combine uh, two values that have different types. One has type string arc and the other has type int arc. So how can we combine the two? Because again, like shoving them into a list, it won't work. They don't share a type. Uh, at this point, you know, maybe you're thinking, hey, could we use the same triggers before, right? Use existentials, discard the type parameter, and, you know, uh, we could, but we're going to use a different trick that's going to turn out to be more, more beneficial. Um, and the core idea is that in a regular list, you can't have elements of different types, right? You can't put in a, an int and a string into a list. So instead, we're going to be uh, constructing what's called a heterogeneous list, uh, a list where the types where you can have elements of different types. So here in is a definition of a, a heterogeneous list. Uh, it's a, it's a, a GADT with two type parameters. One is out, the other is F. And in the nil case, that's the empty list. Then it turns out that out and F are actually the same. So when you have an empty list, out and F are the same. Uh, in the cons case, so that's when you are adding an element to the list, then we, are, we will combine an argument and uh, an already existing argument list, and we'll do it by preserving the out type parameter, and we'll append the A type parameter in front of the F using an arrow type. So this looks uh, uh, probably a bit, bit weird, uh, so maybe some examples will help. So we have our query arg and our page arg already of type string arg and int arg, and uh, here we are creating an argument list with a single element, which is the page arc. And you'll see that the type of this list is int arrow a arc list. So there's still like a, an, an unbound type variable here. And then there's something that seems to signify there's something related to an int in the list, right? Which seems accurate. So if we then construct the, the list that contains both the query arc and the page arc, so it's a, an argument list with two elements, we'll see that the function, uh, that the, the uh, type parameter f changed to being string arrow int arrow a. So again, this function type kind of captures the, the types of the, of the elements in the list. There's something related to an int, uh, to a string in the, in the argument list and something related to an int. So, uh, how can we take advantage of this type uh, to define our fields? So here I've updated our uh, definition of field to now have uh, an arcs value. And um, it's this argument list, again, with the two type parameters. And we'll see that the these two much must add up, so these two are connected, they must be the same. And further, we can see that the f type parameter here is now part of the resolve function uh, here at, at the bottom. So 
whatever kind of is going on with arguments, it, it's tied to the output type and to the resolve function. And, and we're going to be looking first at an example where there's no arguments in how things align. So we're going to be defining the, the root field on the query node. It has name root. The output is a, a folder type. That's the root folder. We had our root folder from, from before, right? And uh, we have an empty argument list, which is arg nil. Uh, and then finally, in the resolve function, we, we have unit as the source type, and we give back the root folder. So let's try to do some unification you know, by hand to see how these types align. So first of all, we know that, that out here, the out type parameter is of type folder, because folder node has type folder GraphQL node. So if we insert that down here, at, uh, in this position, and if you recall that in the nil case, out and f are the same, now we know that f is actually of type folder. And at this point, we can then insert folder uh, down here in the position of f, so we get unit arrow folder. So kind of doing the unification in our head, we can see that in the case where there are no arguments, actually things are exactly as they were before, even though they look slightly more tricky. If we turn to the case where we do have arguments, let's see if things align also and how they, they work out. So we have our search files arguments from, the, from before, an argument list of, of two elements, the curiag and the paycheck, and we had the type uh, string arrow int arrow a. So now we can define the search files field over here. We give it a name. The output type is uh, a list of files. Uh, the axis is search files that we saw on, on the left-hand side. And uh, now the resolve function has a more uh, tricky uh, implementation. Now it's unit arrow string arrow int arrow file list. So how did we end up with that type? Let's try to do unification uh, by hand again. So we'll start out with the, the out value here. We know that uh, the type parameter, the, the type parameter out here has type file list. So we'll insert file list at the position of out here. And this out and this A are actually the same. So this is going to be file list, and this is going to be file list. So the F here the F you see here is going to be string arrow int arrow file list. So if we insert that in this position, we get uh, from the source type arrow string arrow int arrow file list. And since the source type is unit, this is actually exactly what we're getting, uh, the, source, uh, the, the type we're getting here. So this is just like uh, the search files function here is just like uh, imagine we had this function available to us. So as we're changing the, the argument value, the argument value we put in here to have more or less arguments, the type of the resolve function will actually adapt. If we add an argument to the argument list, we will get an additional value uh, exposed to the resolve function down here. Um, so this is like a very neat way of exposing the arguments and the, only the arguments that you've defined to the resolve function. Uh, with very precise typing. So this, uh, for completeness, this is the query type. We can now define it. Uh, we've already seen the, the root field here and the search files field here. So uh, now we've defined all the nodes that we saw in the uh, original graph. We've seen how all the types work out. Uh, so, you know, we're good to uh, ship to production, right? Um, so to recap, we started out with this goal of can we create a GraphQL server library such that uh, the externally exposed schema and the types defined in that schema actually is guaranteed by the type system to correspond to the implementation. And using GDTs first to hide a uh, type variable, that's what we used to define our original version of, of the field type, Secondly, using JDTs to, to uh, you, this type ma parameter manipulation for the list type. And lastly, to introduce an heterogeneous list also based on JDTs 
uh, we saw that that's actually possible, that we can have these uh, this very strongly typed uh, guarantees for, for the graphs we built with this library. And this is not actually, uh, this is not only kind of a, a great for, for correctness, it's also great for performance since we can rule out uh, a number of illegal states, a number of cases that we don't have to deal with at runtime. There's no reflection, there's no uh, coercion, uh, which are typically expensive operations. So uh, if this kind of piqued your interest for GADTs and possibly OCaml, uh, this is kind of this talk is based on a, a, an open source implementation of a GraphQL server library called the uh, OCaml GraphQL server. You can check it out on GitHub if you want to learn more. And uh, otherwise, thanks for listening. Hey, um, can you say something about the compile times, especially if uh, the types get longer and longer? Um, does it have any influence? Um, I mean, in, in terms of compile times, this is very quick. Doesn't really, uh, no, so no below, issues. Below a second, I guess. Definitely, yeah, yeah. no problems. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I hope it's not a silly question, but I wonder how things work with um, duplicate parameters. Can I specify the name twice? Does that work when you're reading from JSON? What happens? I think writing to JSON is probably fine because OCaml takes care of that. Uh, so, I mean, in, in theory, you can define an argument two times having the same name. Uh, there are, unfortunately, things that, that you can't catch in the type system. Uh, you can define a node twice with the same name. You can define the string t uh, node twice. You can define an argument uh, with the same name twice. So there are things that you uh, can't catch in the type system right now. Um, so what, what the library does instead is at, uh, kind of when you, as you, when you start up the, the program, uh, it rejects the schema as being invalid. So you can catch it kind of a, as you start the server rather than when you start serving requests which I guess is, I don't know, as close as optimal uh, as you can get with the current type system guarantees. Hey, Andreas. Hi for the great work on the library I've been using, and it's great. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the choice of um, the heterogeneous list versus um, you know GDTs for for the arguments uh, like I can I can obviously see that you get the signature of the you know the result function for free but it might not be obvious for you know everyone else I guess uh, yeah I mean I think it's definitely like added complexity in using heterogeneous lists for the for the arguments uh, hopefully it's kind of shielded to the implementation and not so much uh, for the users though you mean I think it's hard looking at the type signatures, for example, in documentation, to understand exactly what's going on here, right? Uh, I think it re requires more documentation effort uh, to understand compared to, let's say, the Scala implementation, which has less type safety, but it's maybe easier to understand. Where, I mean, for in, in the Scala implementation, it's like uh, you, get a, you get this mapping, which is not very strongly typed, and, but then you apply, um, uh, an argument, you, you extract uh, arguments from this this not very strongly typed thing. Um, yeah, that definitely a trade-off. I think if you can live with the complexity, then then this is nicer. Thanks. <laughs>